ready? Yep, let's do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, right. good morning. We are in uh, Nyack? Yes. Nyack? Okay. Yes. So, you know, Nyack, New York. Nyack, New York with Alan Bigelow, physicist, pep tester, solar cookers international. I've uh, been around the block a few times with uh, solar cooking, right? And uh, fortunate to be here to talk about uh, his, his testing process, uh, some cookers that he's got, and just solar cooking in general. And uh, but before looking at anything specifically, the question I always ask is, what? Where did you discover solar and solar cooking? What? When did it dawn on you that hey, this is really useful? I can tell you exactly where okay. and when. <laughs> uh, but thank you, first of all, for coming here, for visiting. As I mentioned to you earlier, you're one of our first guests um, in the past year and a half, approximately, because of the pandemic. So welcome, and thanks, thanks again for thanks. making the trip and, and, and planning to visit. So solar cooking is something that I first saw in 2008 in San Diego at the American Solar Energy Society's conference that was happening that year. And I was at that conference um, under a different mission, which was to play music <laughs> and entertain the audience um, with a solar powered rock band. Right. And that's something that we had just uh, started up with. And a good friend of ours was the chair of the local so the San Diego chapter for the American Solar Energy Society and said, come on over. So we did. And we, we went there from here to New York. And when we set up our our thing, our, our, our solar powered music, we noticed that something else was going on right next to us. And it was a whole demonstration by the San Diego Solar Cooking Club. And that was the first time I saw a solar cooker. And I was fascinated by these appliances, these devices, never seen one before. And what we were doing with our solar powered rock band was to look for climate solutions and share this information with audiences. So photovoltaics is one way to go about that. Um, but the solar thermal ideas were something that were fairly new to me, especially when it came to cooking, I had never seen it before. So that was the first time I saw it, and there were a whole array. There was a whole array of cookers on display and being used cooking all kinds of things. So the proof was clear at that moment that these work. And also from my my training as a physicist, I could just see how this made sense that this is going to work. And um, so that that's one thing that really caught my interest, and it was something that. We Started doing regularly. Great. When uh, did you launch the solar for this? I met or did you find them later? How did you get connected with SCI? Yeah, that came later. SCI, Solar Cookers International. Um, the first time I heard about Solar Cookers International was when somebody gave me my first solar oven. And this was in New York City at the Lincoln Center. <laughs> EcoFest was happening and we were invited to perform there. And the woman who was in charge of organizing EcoFest had a box oven. And uh, she said, I live in a, in a small apartment. We get no sun. You all will have much better use of this oven than I do. So please take this. So we accepted it. And along with that oven, had, there was literature. And there was a newsletter from SCI. Uh, and that was also in 2008, just a few months after the, my first view of solar cookers in San Diego. So I, I was aware of SCI at that time, and um, the newsletter was very interesting to read. I, I took in the information, but I didn't yet connect with SCI until quite a few years later, which was right after an extraordinary experience in Nepal, uh, Solar Trek. So a solar expedition in Nepal, um, where for nine days at high altitude, a group of two dozen trekkers ate food and survived uh, on food that was cooked with portable solar cookers. At high altitude, um, we weren't mountain climbing with ropes and stuff, but we were 
reaching 4,000 meters are about the, uh, the equivalent of the peaks of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And uh, it got very cold at night, uh, but we had extraordinary conditions during the daytime. Uh, it was planned for November. And this was led by a wonderful solar cooking advocate named Martin Oltoff, and he's from the Netherlands and has a lot of experience in solar cooking in Nepal with his colleague Ram Kaji Kaudel. And the two of them organized this trek to basically launch the opening of their eco resort that was planned for that same area. And I went along on that trek with our solar powered group, <laughs> but in this case we played acoustically. We, we uh, went with folk songs to work well with the, the ambiance of that trek, which was also spiritual in nature to visit um, some temples and really taking the culture of Nepal along the way. We stopped at a, a Buddhist nunnery. And um, that experience was uh, also a chance for us to play Nepali folk songs and interact with, with the local, local culture. Um, after that was over, I, I promised Martin, um, who was so gracious to, to bring us along, I said, I'm going to do all I can to share this experience with the world. And when we came back from that trek, this was November 2013, I went on the line, online and, and uh, saw that Solar Cookers International was planning a, an international conference that next summer in 2014. I called Julie Green, the executive director, got in touch with her, and I said, I don't know if this will fit, if this is suitable for your conference, but uh, here's a, a little summary of what I just went through, and I'd love to share this. And she said, write an abstract, send it in. <laughs> so I did, and uh, that was really my main introduction to Solar Cookers International, was attending and participating in that conference in 2014 which was very much a milestone, I think, in the, in, the, uh, in the history of solar cooking and the solar cooking movement. Wow. So, so that's already eight years since 2013 Nepal, is it? Yeah, 2013 yeah. in Nepal. So that was yeah. that was when that happened. Sure. Well, and uh, the, you're playing the theme right now is the pep test. And we have the pep tester. <laughs> The machine and the man, right here. Um, so we can move to that. I'll move a couple yeah. cameras and Thank talk you. about that. Okay. 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 Yeah. The pep test. Okay. Why? <laughs> what, what is it? it? What's the pep <laughs> no, test? No, you're talking to a guy mm -hmm. who slept through all the science classes. So Perfect. So let's start with, with let's start with the eighth grade level all right. and move our way up as far as you want to go. <laughs> uh, well, I love teaching. <laughs> it's, it's how I uh, earned some income through graduate school days. Uh, was was that I taught at the uh, at the university and that helped pay my tuition. <laughs> so um, the PEP test, it's PEP is an acronym for Performance Evaluation Process. And that's SCI's branding of its, its testing program. And there's a little bit of a story behind here that actually starts from the SCI conference in 2014. So just coming back to that moment in time, the solar cooking sector that was represented that was represented in Sacramento at that meeting, uh, identified some gaps in the sector and needs. So one of the thing that was identified, one of the things was solar cooker testing according to standards that are internationally recognized and agreed upon. So at that time, there was a number of testing protocol out there so in, in the literature, online, you could find various ways to test solar cookers. And indeed, there is an array of approaches. And SEI at that time was well positioned to get into testing, given that it's a brand agnostic organization. It's neutral when it comes to the technologies, the types of solar cookers. It doesn't promote one brand over another, but it thought, okay, because we are a nonprofit, we have this neutral position, and we also have a good path to 
promote solar cooking at the high level at the United Nations, etc., which I can talk about more later. Sure. The position that SCI had was perfect for launching a testing program so that we would not have, or SCI would not have a perceived conflict of interest. None of our board members are involved with a personal side of, of solar cooking and, and investing in that. So, and neither are the staff members. And that really is important when you share results and prepare reports that when people look at the reports, they might think, ah, yeah, th this one might be a little slanted toward that one. Or, no, we want to really be um, very neutral. And uh, that's <laughs> the background behind this. So uh, at the time, uh, we didn't really know what to do at S or I should say SCI didn't know what to do because I joined SCI a couple years later. But to get started, SCI connected with Pete Schwartz at Cal sure. Poly and some of his students started investigating various approaches to testing cookers and they came up with a with a, some really excellent um, groundwork that we then built upon that led to this and along the way we were encouraged to look at the International Organization for Standardization uh, which had just started working in clean cook stoves and clean cooking solutions and has now published standards for for that so it was a very good timing that ISO was working on clean cooking standards and I have to say to give credit to Paul Arvison who you met yesterday he was a member of the US delegation and active at that time and really did a great job advocating to make sure that solar cookers stayed within the scope of these standards. Um, since then, I've joined the U.S. delegation and have also been pushing for the same thing, that solar cookers keep within the standards, and we've, we've been successful to keep that in there. And the ISO standards point to the ASAE <laughs> S580.1 protocol which is the protocol that we follow. So we, we consider that to be a normative reference and it's part of the ISO standards. And what this machine does is it automates that, that protocol. So this is an ISO test, ISO based test. And um, let me also mention one other person and that's my colleague, Justin Tabachnik, who is based in California. And he's, uh, he, he built this. <laughs> So while I'm here in, in New York and I have plenty of instrumentation experience myself from my uh, previous work, um, I was able to just be on the phone with him and have email exchanges uh, to work together to uh, develop what, what you see here now. So this is a small weather station that has an anemometer to monitor wind speed. This device here is a pyranometer, which is used to monitor the, the amount of sun that we have on the day of the test. So we keep track of that. It's uh, measuring the irradiance in terms of watts per meter squared. And then we have temperature probes that plug in down here and here. And those are maintaining uh, a measurement of the water temperature inside a solar cooker and also the ambient temperature, what is the, the background uh, temperature right now, which is what we'll compare our measurements with. All of these devices are connected to the brain, which is inside the box. And in here, the brain is based on Arduino technology. And so on, on the back of this system here, this part, is an Arduino chip and it's like a motherboard but this is hobby level instrumentation that a lot of students are using these days for hands-on applications they they're able to program uh, various sensors and um, actuators to do things and and have a lot of room for creativity so it's an open source platform and it is accessible so we decided to go with the arduino platform for taking the, the signals from all of these instruments that we have here. Um, ultimately, we store everything on an SD card, which is removable here. So after the test is done, I can take that out, 
and upload that information to the laptop and then start working on data processing. Uh, up here we have an LCD screen, a liquid crystal display, so you can see uh, what the temperatures are in Celsius. Uh, we're, we're just about to have sun here now. Uh, so in channel 2 it says 18.6 degrees Celsius and uh, channel 3 is 23.5 degrees Celsius and the irradiation is very low <laughs> and that's because the sun hasn't arrived yet. But we will see uh, measurements that are upwards of 1100 watts per meter squared when we are in full sun on a good day. And the standard cooking power is a single measurement that's that comes from this test and it's in watts that's the unit and that is a measure of uptake power how much of the sunlight power is now brought into water people can sign up to have their their solar cookers tested uh, through the SCI website www.solarcookers.org and we also publish then the results of the tests along with the reports online for for consumers we want to be able to inform consumers of their choices and um, if you're wondering well what what does that mean <laughs> it's very similar to if you're going to go buy any product really um, you might look over specifications for what that product can do um, one that we're all familiar with I would say is the automobile <laughs> and if I can still uh, talk about the fossil fuel version of the, uh, <laughs> the miles per gallon um, that's a performance specification of a vehicle that will tell you how many miles it can get for a certain amount of fuel and that can help customers in their decision process um, there are of course other aspects to those choices that someone might want to look at such as what color is it what's the price <laughs> how long is it going to last me um, how fast can it really go um, uh, so all of, all of that stuff is extra but there's that one performance specification um, which for the solar cookers it's the standard cooking power and that's what we're going for here in this particular test to really help people with their with their decisions we find that when SCI goes to some of the high-level conferences at the United Nations, for instance, we, we do regularly attend the high-level political forum at the UN in New York, uh, just a few miles down the road here. <laughs> when it's in session right now, we're, uh, we're attending and participating virtually. Um, but when we're in those situations and meeting with ministers, policymakers, people who can really help affect change. They've found that this particular test and these measurements are very important for their own ability to give rationale for solar cooking. And it's really about accountability. And if there isn't a performance specification and let's say the UN Development Program, UNDP, wanted to invest in 10,000 solar cookers. <laughs> what accountability would they have if they chose a solar cooker and there was no performance specification that came along with it? So that now has changed because we have the ability to measure the standard cooking power and bring that into uh, the, the, the whole process. So we have found that at the high level that this is important. Um, consumers are also finding this important. We're, we're hoping that this will become more commonplace, that people will understand what the standard cooking power means, that it makes sense to them, and really what it all boils down to is, is freshman level physics and chemistry e equations, um, which is that power is a function of energy per time, and so energy is, is brought in there with temperature change, when you know what the, the medium is, in this case water, um, there are aspects to different medium that it will involve energy uptake and in how much time does that happen within. So that, this is all based on very fundamental um, uh, equations that we have in physics and chemistry. So that, that's part of the real beauty, uh, part, of the, part of the beauty of this system is that it really is a simple process on paper. Mention your uh, your agnostic. Um, 
Uh, huh. And uh, not to force you to change terminology, <laughs> but I prefer ecumenism because you're okay. basically saying, hey, bring your cooker, any one of them, we'll give you this one objective measure. All right. There are other measures, correct? I mean, then if, you can, if people can come up with tests for them or, or standards that they can justify, they're welcome to. This particular measure is now internationally recognized. Mm -hmm. It's a part of uh, a body of work that was produced by a technical committee with representation from various countries and the uh, American National Standards Institute, ANSI, is the body from the United States that attended uh, and, and participates in that technical committee. There's the Kenyan uh, Bureau of, of Standards, KEBS, um, that is a part of this. And so by having this international involvement to come to these decisions, we find that that, that is something that Solar Cookers International wants to harmonize with and stick sure. very close with. Uh, I appreciate what you just said <laughs> <laughs> about, about uh, maybe changing from agnostic to ec uh, Ecumen <laughs> ecumenical. Uh, ec ecumenism yeah. is everyone is welcome. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, you'll have to make your choice, yeah. but... <laughs> but but from, yeah. from SCI's perspective right now, we are suggesting that people choose solar cookers that have yep. been tested according to this process. Sure. So we, we ask people, look at our PEP results and um, let that guide you for, for your choices. Of course, there, there are other tests within the ISO mm -hmm. standards for durability, safety, and those are other aspects that can be brought in. A big part of those standards look at emissions. Um, oh. Well, solar cookers don't I have think, any. I think we'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to worry about the emission tests for, uh, for the solar cookers. Sure. We're, we're doing really well in that regard. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, unless I can think of anything else where we come back to it, that really pretty well covered it. Okay. Um, and you're using that right now for a couple of, couple of cookers just to, for the sake of... Testing the tester? Or? Yeah, well, um, I actually had this out doing a test two days ago. Okay. I'm, I'm wrapping up one test. And when we finish a test, we prepare a report that we then share with the manufacturer. The manufacturer looks over the report, and we usually talk with them to help them understand the report, answer any questions. And uh, what we seek is their approval of the report, and once they approve of it, and sign off on it, then we can publish it on our website and let people go and uh, and read the reports, but also see see a, a more s summarized view of all of the results as well. And so what I'm doing now is I'm finishing up one test um, for, for one uh, evacuated tube cooker, which is okay. a very interesting uh, uh, technology that's really seemed to be uh, found a new home in the solar cooking sector. Um, so uh, stay tuned for, for those reports. We do have some evacuated tube cookers on our uh, report uh, uh, th that are published right now. So those are, are available. The PEP test station is right now recording the temperature of water inside a cooket. So the cooket has now been PEP tested. And for every uh, cooker that has been PEP tested, we have a, a sticker, a, a, a label that we let the, the the manufacturers know about and there's a label back here it says tested for, for the cooking power and so we've added that to the cook it SCI, SCI is no longer manufacturing so this is another way we can maintain our, our neutrality but we still do have uh, these out in the world and others have have taken on manufacturing the, the cook it as well it's it seems to have been a an excellent starting point for a lot of people to get into the reflective panel the manufacturing process. Sure. Um, over here we have water inside this this pot. We've tested the cook it in two modes actually. One is with a plastic bag greenhouse which was the original suggested greenhouse to use with the cook it. But others in the solar cooking industry and sector have found that there are better greenhouses, and one is to use something that is very much like this. It's clear and smooth. Th these are two Pyrex bowls. And so we make a clamshell by having one there, and then the other one is inverted on top of it. 
And this works very well. It's a measurable difference in cooking power when we compare this to uh, having a plastic bag as, as a greenhouse. And if plastic bags are not available in, in certain areas, uh, some countries are banning plastic bags, and we, we find, uh, we hear about the, the concern that they're not available in certain countries. So how are you going to manage that with solar cooking? Well, this is another approach. It may also be more sustainable. Um, so I have today, just I'm using this with the, the Pyrex bowl. Our, our temperature probe from the pet test station um, is going through the lid. There's a, a feed through, and this is a what we call a type K thermocouple. And it just goes through the lid, and um, it can be set into water inside the cook pan. And this cookware I'm using right now is granite ware. It's somewhat of a standard in the solar cooking sector. Though I, I wonder if this is if, if this is truly the best cookware. I, I actually think it may not be because it's kind of shiny and glossy, uh, which uh, would imply that there, that there may be other uh, cookwares that are more absorbent. But anyway, it's so popular in the solar cooking sector, that's, that's our go-to uh, cookware when we do our tests. And we specify what cookware is used during the test as well because it's part of the, the whole cooking system. Anyhow, that, that temperature goes in the water, and we're recording that with the pet test station. As well, there's another temperature probe that is strapped to the side of this cook pot. And this is something that I'm working with right now just to get some preliminary data for another company that is, has come up with a probe for monitoring usage of cook stoves. And that company is called Nextleaf, and, and we're just working with, uh, with them to, to see how well these might work with the solar cookers. Um, that probe is connected to this little box, where inside this box there, there's a recording of the temperature, and I've just, I'm monitoring the temperature on the side of the pot. Um, and this is also Bluetooth connected, so I can read the temperature on the on the wall of this pot for my phone <laughs> so I might be indoors uh, doing some work maybe I'm even on a webinar and I might want to check what is the the temperature I, I can do that but more importantly is that we're interested uh, for a way to monitor usage of of solar cookers and so Nextleaf is interested to see what what this preliminary data will look like and we'll be able to see if this is something that will actually make sense for monitoring usage of, of solar cookers. Uh, that might help um, large projects that get into carbon credits and that kind of thing, where they really need to know how often are people using these cook stoves. Um, but the general monitoring and evaluation is, is of interest. Um, uh, that, that's why they, they have developed these devices for monitoring and evaluation. So I can. <laughs> Here we go. Yes, <laughs> let's find out. I can go to my phone and uh, pull up the app, and it's telling me right now that that's 22.5 degrees Celsius, which seems reasonable because it's uh, basically room temperature water right now, and I can monitor that over time and upload this to our, our account online and even others in other parts of the world could, could view that information in near real time. Well, we'll, we'll let that continue, but that is something that we, we do at SCI. We are, we are looking for various ways that we can plug in that will be useful for moving this global solar cooking sector forward. We want, that. we want to do that through measurements, through scientific measurements, by using the, the, the PEP test. Um, but as well, we would like to plug in as well as we can with usage information. And then I would have to say that the other side of usage information, the other side from where this is, is when you talk to people. And SCI is very much a promoter of gathering data. Data is something that there's a great need for. When we are at these high-level events at the United Nations, we often meet 
individuals who are in positions that, that could help unlock funding, and they ask for evidence-based results. Show me the data. <laughs> so it's extremely important for anybody involved in the solar cooking initiative to include a data gathering component. And at Solar Cookers International, there are surveys that are available on our website. So people can go there, download them, use them, share the data with us. We'd be happy to then share it with, with others at, at uh, these large gatherings. But the data uh, surveys that we have, one is a quick needs assessment, just to check with, a community mem with community members to find out how interested they are and what their needs are, whether or not they have sun at their house, whether or not they're, they're receptive to trying out a new t uh, cooking technique, this, this new approach, and that will help select participants. Next, we have the Adoption and Impact Survey, which has two parts. One is a baseline survey, and then that's followed by um, a post-usage uh, uh, gathering. So the baseline is basically gathering information such as how much do you spend, how much money do you spend for your cooking fuel, and also what type of cooking fuel do you purchase, firewood, charcoal, etc. Also, how much time might you spend to go out and scavenge and find the, the cooking fuel that you need. So we gather that kind of baseline data. Now after solar cookers are introduced with training through best practices, um, and after some time, perhaps six months, um, the post-distribution questions are asked. And it's really the same questions. Now how much money are you spending on your firewood, charcoal, etc.? And how much time are you gathering, uh, are, are you spending to go and, and gather fuel? So you can get a before and after comparison and you can look at the savings that come um, into uh, a family because of they've, uh, they're now, they've now added solar cooking on top of what they've already been doing. And in addition, you're seeing their savings in time, which can then translate into more time for studies, for developing a career, for instance, and that set of results is extremely attractive for um, members of the United Nations, people who are in these positions to help um, make decisions at the policy level. So that's, that's where we are at SCI to really uh, bring in the best practices for the sector and we have many of these tools and resources on our website and if you need any help finding them, people are welcome to call us, contact us, and, and, and discuss this further. Solarcookers.org. Solarcookers.org, correct, yes. yes. Great. Okay, right. well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the other cookers, okay. and we'll move around some of the cameras for that. Okay, so generally people classify solar cookers into uh, several types, and I'd like to share my suggestion for what's similarly, uh, what's often called the first type. Uh, I would like to call it a reflective panel cooker. And the reason why I'd like to add that term reflective on the front is that when you tell people this is a panel cooker, or that, that's, a, that's a solar panel cooker, if they haven't heard of solar cookers before, they might be thinking about what they have on their roof or what their uncle has on the roof of their house. Sure. And, and I, that's happened many times to me in conversation where I bring up solar cooking and they'll, people think, oh yeah, I, I have solar panels on my house and it's a different type of solar. <laughs> so I thought that it would be important for distinguishing um, solar thermal from solar photovoltaics to add in that term reflective. So if uh, people are willing to do that, please um, add that to the description of a panel cooker. Call it a reflective panel cooker. And I would say that that's, that's essentially what this is. This is the Haynes solar cooker. And uh, we've tested this at SCI. So yeah, it does have a PPP tested sticker here. 
And essentially, this is a reflective material that is uh, able to be put into a shape. It, it, it can roll up and, and uh, store in a yoga bag, a yoga mat bag. But in this case, uh, when you open it up and, and build it into its shape, it actually works very well for gathering and collecting the sunlight. Uh, one thing that Roger Haynes did with this system that, uh, that genius for, 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 for uh, the simplicity and the effectiveness is to add this cover which acts as a greenhouse. And so this is a transparent material. It'll let the sun through and will help keep the heat from escaping. Um, on the inside, another development that, that uh, was added, which I think helps very much with, with the, the, the effectiveness of this cooker, is this sleeve. So this sleeve also helps store the heat inside. It, will, it, it, it acts as a secondary greenhouse, so to speak, that um, it will lift the pot up off the base and allow sunlight to get in, but to keep the heat in there as well. This pot is uh, quite good as a matte black, um, and then he's also using a transparent top on this particular setup. So when we, when we tested this cooker, uh, we used this cookware. Uh, there's a picture of it in the report, and we, we have to identify that in the report, what the cookware is, because we're looking at the whole system. The cooking system, not just the solar cooker, but also the cookware, sure. and that's something that's very important for for testing all cook stoves. So coming back to those ISO standards, um, any cook stove that's tested, it's important to look at the whole system, including the cookware. So uh, that this is the the Haynes solar cooker, which I think now is known more as the Haynes one because there's a Haynes two, <laughs> but uh, this is one that uh, first came out and has found a lot of use throughout the world in various places, so anyone could follow up with Roger Haynes to, to learn more. Okay, sure. o over here uh, we have an example of a box oven. Um, this is the Sun Focus, which is made in the United States by David Chalker in upstate New York. And this is very much a box oven in that you'll see the, the basic components of a box oven. Basically a box that's within a box. So the inside box um, has black walls in this case, uh, black mat, which are very good for, it's very good for absorbing sunlight and converting the energy of light to thermal energy. And then that is set within a larger box with some insulation in uh, between the two walls. There is a cover that you can adjust the, the angle with. And so for today, I'm setting it right about to then go through this window. Um, then there are the two side reflectors that also help gather additional light. Um, David Chalker has used uh, two glass windows. So this is a double glazing, as they might say. And one more thing that he has done, which uh, very few solar cooking, very few solar cooker manufacturers will do. Um, he's added electronics in here so that this is actually a hybrid solar cooker. It's a solar electric, meaning solar thermal, but also electric in that you can plug it in with this uh, down here and, and turn it on and there's an electric heater on the inside. So in case, clouds come or it gets dark and maybe your food isn't quite finished, you can continue cooking with, with that. Uh, for the tests that we do, the PEP tests, we only test for solar thermal, so the direct solar energy. All right, so that is the Sun Focus. It has also been PEP tested, hence you see a sticker applied here to show that. So please look for the sticker when you're looking for solar cookers and maybe which one to add to your collection. <laughs> um, all of these solar cookers are devices that give us energy, um, energy security. And given the unknowns and uncertainty to what would happen during a pandemic, something like a solar cooker can really be beneficial for everyone's lives. And in our cases here, uh, where we solar cook regularly, we found uh, 
that aspect to be more important than ever before in that we just didn't know whether or not there would be large-scale infrastructural, <laughs> if that's a word, infrastructure um, disruptions such as utilities, electricity, gas, um, but we can depend on the sun on sunny days. So the sun comes to your house, free delivery, right to your doorstep, and more important in areas around the world where people might have to go to a market to buy their firewood or their charcoal, with solar cookers they can reduce the amount of trips to the market, hence they reduce their chance of getting exposed or transmitting the virus. So solar cookers have really been critical during these kinds of health crises. And SCI has a, a blog about that, where we have our top 10 uh, reasons for why solar cookers are important during pandemics. But fantastic appliances to bring energy security into our lives. And um, in the case when then there isn't sunlight, if you have electricity, whether or not it's coming through the municipalities or maybe you're making it yourself with, with your home grid, <laughs> you can plug something like this in as well. Sure. Okay, so reflective panel cooker, hybrid box oven. And if we're ready to move along to one more that we've tested uh, fairly recently, this one comes in a suitcase, and uh, this is called the Fornelia, and on a nice stand that uh, it can swivel on, and be used for helpful for tracking the sunlight. When we open this, you'll see what it, it is on the inside. There we go. Okay, this is an evacuated tube cooker. And this is made in Cyprus by the company Fornelia. And there's an adjustment back here for the angle. Very easy to use. And then pivot it to follow the sun. There's a tray here, which is useful for setting in your food. Um, and then you insert that into the oven like that. Give it some time. This is an extraordinary cooker, I would say. If you'd like to learn more about it to see how well it tested, please visit our website to look at, at the performance results. This particular system also has an added sleeve, which is metal. And so the manufacturer decided to add this uh, extra tube to the inside of the vacuum tube. And it gets hot. <laughs> so that also may be something that is useful when you look at the, the durability and lifetime of something like this and the overall effectiveness. So um, this is the Fornelia. Fornelia Mini is what it's called, sure. actually. <laughs> so I wonder what the Fornelia, uh, <laughs> the, the larger scale one will look like. In fact, if you visit their website, um, you can find out more information about this particular cooker. Of and course, it has been PEP tested. And we've added the sticker here right next to the manufacturer's label with their website. So you can find out as much more information as you want about this cooker that is made in Cyprus. All right, and what now, what would you, yeah. what, we, what did you categorize this one as? This is an evacuated tube cooker. So in the, in the past, people would have talked about three types of cookers, three basic types, reflective panel, box oven, and parabolic cookers. I'm not showing any parabolics ah. today. Um, but now with the evacuated tubes coming on the market, this, has earned a spot as yes. one of the main types of solar cookers, I think. Yes. So we, we do include that in our presentation material these days, and we, we showcase PEP-tested cookers, examples of them in our presentations that we give at the United Nations, etc. Sure. So this is the Haynes 2 cooker, and we pet-tested this, and the results are on our website. 
see the tested for cooking powers label with direction on how to find more information about that in the reports. And this cooker is similar material to the first Hanes, but I would say it's just bigger. For the most part, it has a larger intercept area and can collect more incoming sunlight. Similarly, you have an outer dome, um, or it's a, it's a conical top, and on the inside you have a transparent top, the, uh, the transparent sleeve that the pot sits in, and all of this is very light, so for campers perhaps, or those who might need um, to have a, a ability to pick it up easily and, and move it around and store it, um, this could probably work well for that. Uh, it certainly uh, cooks food. I've cooked some food with this as well um, and have seen these in, in other places around the world. Um, there are two settings for, for this cooker. If you see, the, there's a blue snap and a red snap. Um, right now we have it set in the, in the blue snap position, which would be for lower uh, sun elevation angles. And that's the setting that we had it in when we did the test because we did the test later in the fall, later in the season when the sun elevation was lower. However, and we specify that in the report, for, for a day like today, we're just a few days from solstice, from summer solstice. So if, if one needs to, they can just change the, the position by changing the snaps. And you essentially are changing what I like to call the elevation angle of the cooker. So now we have it in the high sun position. And it does a pretty good approximation of a, of a parabola. And you just set that toward the sun and let it do its job. I might make one more comment on the approximation of a parabola in optics. Now, I have a lot of background in optics. I used to work with lasers and particle accelerators when I was in grad school and the first 15 years of my career <laughs> um, in research. And in those cases, you're really looking for pinpoint focus conditions. You want your high quality optics to be as good as they can be because you want to optimize a system. Now, with a solar cooker, people might wonder, do, do you need to have a perfectly smooth uh, parabolic shape? And the answer that I give is no. <laughs> you don't have to. And the reason why is that your target is so big. It's a cooking pot. And it's, it's large so that uh, you don't have to worry about a pinpoint focus of the sunlight you can get by with an approximate focus. And a lot of the solar cookers, um, even in the parabolic versions, are, are made of strips of metal that fan together, the SK-14, for instance. And those work great. In fact, they, they do a good job of distributing the sunlight across the, the size of the cookware. And this, this does a similar job in that it's not a perfect parabola, but that's OK because the target, the cooking pot, is large compared to um, the size of your optics here. This is an optic element. <laughs> so um, this reflective panel cooker, uh, designed by Roger Haynes, has been DEP tested by Solar Cookers International, and we have the results on our website, so please, please go there and take a look. A great advantage that solar cooking has is that you can have an effective cooker that is made in a pretty simple way. Uh, you don't have to go to high-end manufacturing. I mean, you can if you want to, <laughs> but but there's such a there's such flexibility in the manufacturing process to still produce very good results. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a new kit on the block, and this cooker we received last fall for testing at SCI and we tested it in two of our locations. So we actually were working with two of them. And the manufacturer, Glenergy, asked that we test it in three different configurations. And so we have, and this configuration that you see here is the largest 
configuration, which means that you open these extensions up and you have the entire cooker with added boost, added power from gathering more sunlight. Um, this cooker is an evacuated tube cooker. And I'm just going to close these back down for a moment because otherwise it will get very hot very quickly. <laughs> and uh, just to show you the, the tray that's being used in and out of the cookware is made by Go Sun. And I'll just take that out so you can see. This is the, the Go Sun Fusion cookware, which does have a plug and an electrical heater. So this is also made for for hybrid usage. And Go Sun has now basically purchased the license to use uh, this model to to market, distribute, to sell it. So with Go Sun now um, having that arrangement with Glenergy, the, the two companies have an association with each other. They're uh, able to now sell this through GoSun, and it's the GoSun Sizzle. We've actually updated the title of this cooker. Um, instead of calling it the Glenergy with extensions, which we had originally on a report, where it's now called the, the GoSun Sizzle, and we, we made that update uh, by request of, of the, the two organizations. Okay, so this goes in here. This is... A cooker made for a, a single family, I would say. It's uh, uh, in fact all of these are household level cookers, and you can cook a good amount of food in them, depending on which one you're using. Uh, they have different powers, and you can you can find out that information on our website. But I mentioned the term household level cooker because that's different from institution level cookers. And one thing we're, we're now working with at the International Organization for Standardizations is to develop standards now for institutional cookers. I was on a call yesterday morning with uh, the technical committee to start drafting those, st those testing standards, which will be a little different from the standards that we use for testing these, these household level cookers. But again, for the sizzle, you open these extensions, catch a good amount of light. There's a sundial here that you can use to help position. Okay, when I, when I see the shadow there, I, I move it back and it's, it's online. As well, it has a, an adjustment here. So you can swing it through its elevation angle. And then just tighten that down. So that, um, these are the solar cookers that I have on hand that we have PEP tested at SCI. There are a few more that we have tested, and um, some of those cookers have gone back to the manufacturer. Um, in one case, there was the, the Star Flower that Mary Buschenek and Jennifer Gasser actually have it in, in their homes. <laughs> uh, they, they use that in their, in their demonstrations and in their work, but it was here for a while. And I tested it, and then when we were done, they, they took it back. I love the creativity in this sector. The solar cooking sector has so much room for creativity. We're seeing new designs all the time. Um, and the individuals who are working in this sector are passionate, they're creative, and they've found a way to make it happen. And so for countries that are interested in promoting solar cookers in their country, look at ways to help make that happen. We need more funding. We need more um, in encouragement from uh, the government leaders. So policy change, um, subsidies, perhaps reduce taxes on imports if that's going to be the approach, but also encourage local manufacturing so that this can really take off, uh, particularly in countries that are so uh, blessed with sunshine. When the United, is it the United Nations has, what is it, sustainability goal, goals or uh, 
targets, whatever, it's like 20 of them, blah, I don't know how many. Okay, and 17. 17. Yes. And I recall there is, I think on the SEA website, how solar cooking meets all 17. That's right. I mean, and how many, how many other projects, programs, tools uh, hit all 17? We have right? taken the time yeah. to write down how solar cooking connects with uh, gender equality, ending poverty, food, you know, a ending hunger, health, um, environment issues, um, water quality, air quality, um, energy of course, <laughs> which is the obvious one, but also for, for peace um, and, uh, and partnerships. We, we, can't, we, we can't do this on our own. We have to do this together with other actors. Um, but there, there is right now a lot of tension uh, in many parts of the world because people need access to cooking fuel and in some areas that's actually causing uh, tension and uh, violence um, unfortunate situations that happen around uh, the periphery of refugee camps in some areas and SCI has taken the time to spotlight how solar cooking can have a positive benefit on each sustainable development goal. Other organizations have listed how their technology or their approaches may fit best with certain goals, but we've gone for all sure, of them. Sure. And what this does is it makes it what some people like to call low-hanging fruit. You know, it's, it's not hard. You put your food in there and you can walk away and do other things. Uh, and, and the technology that's in, involved ranges from things that you can build at home with with materials that you might actually have or that are certainly local, locally available, on up through higher technologies. Um, so given that it is so accessible and it can have such a great impact, we, we're really trying to uh, get these policymakers to understand that and then to follow up and do something about it. So that's, that's part of our, our mission. <laughs> there, there's a need for a comprehensive understanding of the benefits solar cookers have. And so I want to take a moment and thank you, Luther, <laughs> for what you're doing to help collect stories from the solar cooking sector and then amplify them through your, your video series. Because every person who you speak with is having a part of, uh, of all of this to promote clean and sustainable cooking that can be helpful to so many people on this planet. And I also thank you for that from uh, a vision that I have from my childhood. <laughs> I mentioned to you both earlier that, that I grew up overseas mm -hmm. and we were living in various countries where there is a high level of poverty and a lot of the conditions that we talk about when we talk about solar cooking and how they can be beneficial for, for so many people, um, we would see that normally when we would, uh, regularly when we would travel around the country. And so from my childhood, I had this memory of seeing women and girls wandering across barren areas of, of the countries that we were living in. Um, we were in the country that's now called Burkina Faso, for, for example, for, for two years. I was 10 years old, 9, 10, 11 years old. And that's just a vision that, uh, it's a memory that I can never let go of seeing that in person. So when I first saw a solar cooker in 2008 in San Diego, I had two perspectives. One from my physicist mind, <laughs> that that can work. <laughs> that can work, and then the other is, from my childhood and the memories of seeing um, women and girls walking across barren land and then coming home with bundles of wood on their head, um, that this technology, these appliances can be so useful and beneficial to those people. And so thanks again for, for your part in, in helping to broadcast this message and pass this along to those who really need to hear it. Well, and thank you for the time setting out and putting out your spread, uh, the, whole, the whole nine yards, uh, well above and beyond. This is fantastic.
Thank you. My pleasure, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again wherever oh, in the, yeah. on the world that well, might be. <laughs> maybe Console Foods 2022. thing for you so oh. before you turn, oh, okay. turn those off <laughs> okay just have a little thing, something here that's a, it's a, a small a small gift for you um and this is just to say thank you again for coming by and for your efforts in spotlighting what solar cooking is the many benefits that it has who's involved in all of this work and it's a wonderful network, uh, a great group of folks. And um, at Solar Cookers International, we, we sometimes have little tokens of our appreciation. And I, I'd like to oh, give this to you. <laughs> Here's a, a coffee mug with uh, SCI colors. And um, I hope that you have many chances to have solar <laughs> coffee. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it's a shape. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.